missionaries are normal people like you and I who have been trained sometimes in a profession, sometimes in scripture, sometimes in teaching, education, who give their lives to Jesus Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel, the Great Commission. They go, they go into places that you and I would never maybe even think of going. Maybe never would have the chance to go. Maybe you can't go because of some physical ailment. You know, I think of uh, Isaiah and them up in the mountains. And, and uh, I know I get altitude sickness, so I, I'm, I can't go there. I can't do what they do up in Cusco and, and different areas like that where they're way up in the mountains above 10,000 feet. Um, I don't do well up there. I can be up there for a little bit, but I can't stay there. And praise the Lord for people who have vision, people who have the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, and people who are willing to leave their family, to leave their nation. <laughs> Although some of us might sign up to leave right now, right? Um, leave their nation and go to a place where there are no other Christians, where they don't have a community of churches that they can lean on, where all their friends are not saved, where they may be the only Christians in an entire area of a nation. You know what? They have enough to present Jesus Christ. They have enough all by themselves to present Jesus Christ. They don't need a Christian bubble. They don't need a, a network of believers. They have the Holy Spirit of God. They have the Word of God. And they have everything they need to win people to Jesus Christ. And when our missionaries go into all the world and they enter into these countries where maybe there is no gospel presentation, maybe there's a false teaching that's already gone in before them, and they've got to come in without the popularity, without the momentum, without all the stuff that, well, American churches think they have to have in order to do the ministry today. They don't have any of that stuff. And yet they plant churches. They start orphanages. They start Christian schools. How do they do that? Where do they get the resources to do that? Where do we get our modern idea of what missions is and, and how missions work? Where do we find these things today? I mean, this is all man's system we had to think up after the Bible, right? Or maybe, just maybe, if we study and read enough of the Bible we might find the very core essence of what we do even today in the church when it comes to missions, writing God's word. How awesome would it be if God were to just spell out for us how churches are to work together to try to get missionaries onto the mission field? Wouldn't it be awesome if God just laid it out there for us and, and all we had to do was follow it? Guess what, guess what God did in 2 Corinthians Chapters 8 and 9. In 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, Paul takes time and develops the idea of how modern missions is to function. How modern missions is to work. How churches are to work together to do the work of the ministry. And this is why we have our Minnesota Association of Regular Baptist Churches. Why we have a state meeting. Why we give cooperatively for a Christian camp. Why we give cooperatively with mission agencies to support missionaries to get them overseas and to get them into areas that we couldn't do it by ourselves as single churches. And what we're going to see today is God's plan for financing his world missions. It would be, how, how right would God be to give us a command to do something and give us no means by which to do it? In other words, God said, go reach the whole world. You say, well, I want to be very fair. If we don't know how to do it, how will we do it? Well, God didn't leave us floundering around. Individually, he's given you what? He's given you really three things. He's given you, number one, your salvation. Amen? Amen. Number two, he's given you his spirit. And number three, he's given you his word. If you want to throw a fourth one on there, individually, he gave you also the Church, the fellowship of the believers, the encouragement of one another. How many of those do you have to have to be a missionary? You need your salvation, you need the Holy Spirit, and you need 
the word of God, right? You got those three, you can go anywhere in the world and do ministry today. And Lord willing, I, I would believe that every believer that's in this building today has three, if not four, of those things necessary. Because most of us sitting in here today are part of the local body of believers in Sauk Center, in this place called the church. So this morning we come to the Sunday before our missions conference. We come to the Sunday before we make our commitments concerning our individual families and what we're going to do in missions this next year. We begin to pray about that. We begin to think about hosting missionaries and, and doing food and meals and gift cards and different events for the missions conference and things like that. But really what we're coming to is we're coming to a place where we're going to see the original intent that God had for missions play out right before our eyes. We're going to see four churches getting together to do a missions conference to raise funds for missionaries so that they can go back to their fields and use those funds to help those that have needs or to help the ministries where they are and the needs that those ministries have. And we're going to see this is pulled right from the text today that you have read together corporately with me at the start of the service. So I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to rehash and go back through a lot of the scriptures today, but I'm going to give you the scriptures that go with the points. And uh, this morning, this is not meant to be exhaustive. It's not meant to be uh, answer every question you might have when it comes to missions or God's plan for global evangelism or anything like that. But it's simply to point out why do we do our missions conference the way we do? Why do we do at Faith Baptist Church, Faith Promise Missions? And why do we as churches go through all the effort of coordinating four or five, six churches together to do a missions conference? Why can't we just have one missionary come in? He preaches to us and we call it a conference. Why can't we do that? Well, we do that as well, don't we? We have missionaries come through all throughout the year. Uh, this year in 2020, I've had to cancel five uh, just due to the fact that we weren't meeting at certain times when several of them were to come in. I actually had one scheduled. He's a missionary to Israel. I was excited for him, but Lord willing, 2021, he'll be here. So we rebooked him, and uh, I'm not going to say his name because, well, frankly, Missionaries can't be missionaries in Israel, if you know uh, the politics that go on over there. So, uh, but if you want to know who he is, I'd be glad to tell you later on. But as we sit on the brink or on the Sunday before missions conference, I was thinking, I wonder how many of us understand where God's plan for missions comes from. Where is it these mission agencies? Where is it that missionaries, where is it that churches get the idea of working together to do the missions the way that we do it today? And the answer is found in First Corinthians, and I introduced First Corinthians 8 last week, but this week we're really going to develop because this story that is referenced in these two chapters actually begins in First Corinthians 16 and actually culminates in, in Second Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to kind of take a glance at those two passages. Last week we did at 1 Corinthians 16. We also went to Romans to show you that this was something that Paul had been working on and had been excited about doing. And he was excited to go to Corinth to pick up the gift that he was going to take to Jerusalem. And he was going to stop in his Jerusalem on his way to Rome. And uh, so this, this whole story, this whole event is even mentioned in the book of Romans. It's, I mentioned it earlier in the service today in the introduction. This passage of scripture is also mentioned in Galatians. And this gift that is talked about in, in the giving and the, and the motivation for giving. The church of Galatia was a part of that. The church of Ephesus had a part in this as well. And when we talk about the churches of Arcadia, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Galatian, or Galatia, Corinth, Ephesus, and other churches that are in this region. And we know from the narrative as well that Paul had actually used the church of Corinth in Macedonia to encourage the Macedonians to give a gift to the poor of Jerusalem based on what the Corinth church was doing. The Corinth church said, hey, give us a year to raise the funds. We're going to raise the funds and we're going to pray and we're going to give and we're going to take a whole year to save up. So Paul, when you come back through, we're going to give you that gift. And we're ready to do it. And as Paul's going around the different churches on his missionary journey, he's saying, hey, Corinth is doing this gift. Macedonia, what are you going to do? 
Hey, Corinth is going to give this gift. Galatia, what are you going to do? Hey, Ephesus, Corinth is going to give this gift. What are you going to do? And we see Paul going from church to church and admonishing them to give. So after waiting a year for Corinth to, to do their faith promise, to fulfill the promise they made to take care of this need that was in another church, the church of Jerusalem, there's a need in Jerusalem and Corinth is going to meet the need by saving up money. And Paul is going around to other churches fundraising as well. They come to the place where now it is time to collect the gift. That is 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Now it's time to collect the gift. And we skipped over the passage of Scripture starting in verse 16 of chapter 8, where Paul is sending Titus, ever heard of him? And Paul is sending Titus to go to the church of Corinth to make sure the gift is ready. To make sure that everything's in line and that we're ready to receive the gift. And then in chapter 9 and verse 1, Paul says, I don't need to write to you because you already know the gift that you're about to give. And I'm about ready to be coming through to collect the gift. And I want you to be ready and I want you to be ready to give willingly and not as an extraction. How many have ever been to the dentist and had a tooth extracted? Okay, that's the idea here. It, you're not giving it up willingly, right? It's fighting root, nerve, all, all inclusive inside the mouth. And, and Paul says, look at, the, look at chapter 9 and uh, look at verse, uh, the last verse there, verse 5, verse 6. Uh, verse 5, so that I thought it necessary to urge you brothers to go on ahead of you and arrange in advance for the gift that you've promised so that it may be ready and w a willing gift and not a <laughs> pulling of teeth. Right? It's not painful. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't... You get the idea, right? A willing gift. It's like when the tooth just falls out by accident. You bite the apple and you're like, hey, there's my tooth. Right on. Uh, Jacqueline is in the process of losing teeth right now. And, and every one that just falls out is a good one. And the other ones that are hard, she's like, this one won't come out. And she's wiggling and trying to get it to come out. And it just won't come, won't come. And then one day it just falls out. It's a willing tooth, not an extraction. It's an extraction when I threaten to tie fishing line around it and slam a door. Right? Or get the pliers out. So he says, as we notice here, the... The narrative is Paul is getting them ready for something that they faith promised to give to the church of Jerusalem. They're doing this by faith. They took a year to raise the finances and now they're encouraging other churches to give through their giving. And we see that this is something Paul is using. And as he's traveling around, he goes to the Macedonians and he begins to give recognition to the church of Corinth and um, we see in verses eight or in chapter eight and chapter nine that the word grace is associated with the giving. That grace is either a reason for giving or a byproduct of the gift. And grace is mentioned seven times in chapter eight and three more times in chapter nine. I want to share with you an equation that Paul gives here as well in these two chapters of scripture. That is through great affliction, great poverty, and great joy that equals their liberality or generosity. The word liberality there literally means to be free from ulterior motives. It's uncalculating. It's, it's unadulterated joy of giving motivated by a heart that wants to serve God. The motivation for giving is their heart. We need to note also that this giving is in obedience to the face of trying circumstances that are overwhelming the Macedonian givers. They're under great persecution for their faith. They're at a place where if they were employed, unless they renounced their Christianity, they would not be able to, to even work in some places. Uh, we've seen that in America at times. There was a time in Salt Lake City, unless you were of the Mormon church, it was very difficult to get some jobs. It was very difficult to be incorporated in. In the Northeast, we've seen it with Roman Catholicism. Early in American history, where unless you were part of the Catholic church, 
It was very difficult to get a job in certain areas. It was very difficult to get involved. And Macedonia is no different than these little isolated spots in America where it happened. Where the Macedonians, there was a high price for taking on Christianity. A high price in the way that you lived and the income base that you would be able to have. But the text makes it absolutely clear also that the Macedonians... Stewardship does not depend on their circumstance. It's a, it is solely dependent on the quality of a relationship they have with Jesus Christ. They gave because they were recipients of amazing grace. Look with me at verse 4 of chapter 8. Why don't you go back to verse 4 for a second and look at what it says. Chapter 8 and verse 4. Begging earnestly... For the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Have you ever seen somebody beg to give money away? Have you ever, ever seen somebody actually beg to give money away? I mean, please, let me give to this offering. I don't care if the need is met or not. I want to give. How much do they need? What do we, we got to do? How, mu how much is it going to take? What, it, it, 20, 40, 60, 80? I mean, talk to me, help me out. What's it going to take to meet the need that they had? That's the Macedonians. What's it going to take? I mean, how much does Corinth have? Because if they can't make it, we want to make the rest of it up. It literally says this, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints wherever they are. The Macedonians considered it a privilege to aid their brother and sisters that were in need at the church of Jerusalem. Nobody was asking them to give. They were challenged of their own heart to give. Although the offering is being taken... The major thrust of the Macedonian giving was a heart for missions. How do we know that? Let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Join me at verse 7. I love the wording that Paul uses here in this passage of Scripture. If you don't have a Bible, the words are up on the screen for you there. But it says this. Paul is speaking here. He says, Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge, I robbed other churches. Notice what he said. <laughs> I robbed other churches to preach to you. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and I was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Arcadia. And why? Because I do not love you. Oh, God knows I do. He says, that's not the reason. It's not because I don't love you that I don't want your money. It's not because I don't care that I don't want your money. Paul says, the Macedonians have met all of my needs and they want all the money that Corinth said they were going to give to go directly to the gift. They want it all to go there. So the Macedonians not only took up the offering, but they also took care of Paul. How awesome is that? So he tells the Corinth believers, you know what? There's no way that you're going to throw it on me to say that I took money from you and your gift can't be as big because all of your gift is your gift. It's all what you do. Go back with me to chapter 9. Now look with me at verse 6 through 9. Paul is talking about how he sent Titus ahead to get the gift ready in Corinth that, that it might be ready to be given to the missionaries. And if you don't come to any night of the missions conference, I encourage you to come Wednesday night. Wednesday night, it's hosted right here at our church. It'll be the four churches, pastors, and the four churches coming together and bringing their offerings together and giving the gift to the missionaries. And it's such a great time to see what God does through churches. And last year, what was it, 13-some thousand dollars? was given, was raised in just a couple weeks for five different missionaries. So you can imagine how much, I want to say it was, somebody do the math on that, 2,600, something like that a person? Uh, I don't know, it was a lot. It was a lot for each of the five ministries. 
But look, if, well, look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 9, because Paul says um, here exactly what he is trying to get across to the church of Corinth and what he's sharing as he's going to Ephesus and Galatia and to Macedonia. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as, what does the next phrase say? He decided in his own heart. That's what Faith Promise Missions is all about. What every person's going to do in their own heart. Not reluctantly, nor out of extraction, right? Not, not out of compulsion. For God loves the cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound to you. He's able to supply every need that you might have so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work as it is written. And it talks about how he freely distributes and he is freely given to the poor and how he gives to all his what? How many of you have received the righteousness of God? How many of us have received the righteousness of God in a measured way? Versus how many of us experience the righteousness of God in an unmeasured way? He says, the God who is able to distribute freely, why? Because he doesn't run out of resources. The God who's able to distribute freely has given to the poor and his righteousness endures how long? As long as he does. Forever and ever. He who supplies seed to the sower, he who gives bread to for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. What causes people to praise? What causes us to praise God? When we see his word fulfilled. When we see the character of God made right and before our eyes, that fosters worship. Let me prove this point. If you had a need and you prayed about the need, and let's say the need was you needed $200 to, to pay a bill that was unexpected, and you don't have it. You go out in your mailbox and you find a check in your mailbox, a refund check from your bank who overcharged you on your mortgage for the last year and a half, it seems like, and all of a sudden, out in your mailbox, you walk out there and there's a $300 check and you open that envelope, you look in there and you see that check and you go, man, God, why did you do that? That's it. I'm not going to worship him anymore. Who does that? Who does that? No, you open the envelope, you see 300 bucks and what do you do? Woo! I got 50 bucks to eat out with. Right? I mean, you automatically go in your brain. The, the need's met. Now I got more than I need. What, what am I going to do with the rest of it? What I, and this is exactly what God says his character is like. This is what God wants to do in each of our lives. Not just in your finances. He wants to do it in your prayer. He wants to do it in your walk with him. He wants to do it in your service for him. Whatever you do, do it heartily. As unto who? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of 1 Corinthians 10.31, right? By the way, isn't that sandwiched like in the same people group here? 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. God is trying to get across to the church of Corinth. Man, I am a God that not only supplies your needs, but I can do more than you think. But you've got to do the first steps. The first step, is, and it's clearly evident what the first step is. Your heart has to be mine. Jesus Christ is saying, your heart has to be mine. Your giving, your service, your attitude, your joy, your peace, your long suffering, your gentleness, your goodness, your faith, your meekness, your temperance is all tied to where your heart is with God. Because where your heart is, there your... It's based on the heart. Your giving, your service, your praise, your joy, all of it's based in your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, and out of the same vessel can come good and 
evil. James talks about that a lot, doesn't it? And what we say, what we do, and it's one thing to say something, but it's another thing to do something. I love Paul in Romans uh, chapter 7. The things I do, I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. And if I'd stop doing the things that I do and just do the things that God wants me to do, how better off would it be? But oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me? I got somebody. Chapter 8. How about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit of God will come into your life, and he'll take over your life. I love that last song that we sang before this message. If I could have one thing in this world, who would it be? Give me Jesus. And when I'm ready to die, whether it's of a pandemic or a heart attack, or I'm just old and ready, or it's a car accident, or it's cancer, or it's the flu, or it's something else. But at the point of death, the Christians should long to see Jesus. And when we're healthy, we should long to serve Jesus. And when we're alone and think we're lonely and nobody cares, there's somebody that cares. He cares. He said, I must go away, but I'm going to send another just like me to come. And he will comfort you. Numatos. Numa means spirit. Holy Spirit, Agios Numatos, the Holy Spirit of God, will be there to comfort you and take care of you. So this morning, using the Bible as an example, I could take you to uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, because, well, that's a logical thing to do, Right? It's your reasonable service, your spiritual worship. So using the Bible as an example this morning, I want to give you just a couple quick things here about faith promise and why we do it and how we do it here at Faith and Why. And it's based solely upon the Bible and what we've just presented to you from the scriptures of God. But the first thing I want to do is answer this question. What is faith promise? What is the faith promise plan? How, how does faith promise work? The second thing I want to look at is, does every believer give missions through faith in the faith promise plan? Does every believer give to missions through the faith promise plan? The third thing I want to look at is this. What steps should a believer follow in making a faith promise commitment? And then we're going to look at a final thing here in just a moment uh, that I'll develop once we get through these three. But the first one is this. What is faith promise? Faith promise is simply this. The plan is this, an agreement made by you to God. Let's call it this. It's a vow. If a man vows a vow before God, what must he do? He keeps it. So it is a promise by faith that over the next year, regardless of what happens, God's going to be able to provide through us X amount to go towards missions. Why a year? Well, that's how we base our budgets off of, right? How, how long did Corinth have to raise theirs? How long they have? A year. a year, right? So even in the Bible, they took a year to raise the amount of money they were going to give towards the mission work of the church. In this situation, it was the poor of Jerusalem and the needs of the church of Jerusalem. In our case, it's to support 10 different missionaries in six or seven different fields now. And to do it for the glory of God. And we support them on a monthly basis. So the income that comes in for Faith Promise missions comes in through Faith Promise, goes out, and 100% of what's given goes directly to the missionaries. The church keeps nothing of it. So it's an act by faith where we're willing to say to God, I'm trusting you to provide a certain amount, determined through prayer, that I might give it towards missions. It's an offering given to God. Number two, does every believer give to missions through faith promise plans? Um, the answer to that is no. Not every believer does give through faith promise. Some give to missions directly. Some give nothing. Some give in other ways and other types of service for the Lord. But through the, or through the, through the church, um, to glorify God, giving was done through the church, through a faith promise giving. Number three, what steps should a believer follow in making a faith promise commitment? 
Well, according to 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, a faith promise was God's plan of financing world missions for his glory. It was also going to help with church planning. As Paul was traveling around, what was he doing? He was planting churches wherever he went. And when he planted church, he would tell the believers, hey, get on board and helping out the church of Jerusalem. Let's give to the poor. Let's, let's do the work of the ministry. We know from this passage of scripture also as Paul traveled around, he was supported by other churches. We know at different times in different places that the Macedonian church supported him. We know uh, there was times where the Galatian church supported him. We know there was other churches as well that supported the ministry of Paul. We know what is the main church that supported him? The church of Antioch. Remember Antioch? The sending church of Paul, the apostle. So we know that churches were involved in sending out missionaries and we know it's God's plan. So how do we today make a faith promise commitment? How do we do that? What are the steps? Well, the first one is we need to make a commitment by taking a card. And uh, they are in the back today. If you want to grab one today, I was going to make them available next week. But I thought, well, we're going to talk about it. And maybe somebody wants to see one. Uh, so they're in the back. It's a little uh, third sheet of paper. And it's got our church logo on it. And it talks about faith promise on there. And on the one side, it gives you some Bible verses. On the other side is the commitment form itself. But you take a commitment card. You write down the amount that God has laid on your heart. Maybe it's a weekly. Maybe it's a monthly. Maybe it's an annual gift. However you want to give. Um, that God has laid on your heart. And uh, you write that down. And then when an offering is taken up, you, you put it in the offering. And... Every week or every month or however you make your commitment, that's what you give. You don't give it as an extraction. You don't give it out of obligation. You give it out of a cheerful heart. Number two, we follow through with the commitment. We set that side, aside that amount with the numbers that we give. Maybe it's just $15 a week. Maybe it's $65 a month. Do you realize that today if we had 30 people give just $15 a month, we would have support for every single one of our missionaries and we could add to the amount that we give. $65 a month. How many, how many of us have ever spent 65 bucks on a meal? $65 a month would support every missionary we have in our faith promise commitment right now. Number three, continue to give as you promised throughout the year. Go to Galatians chapter 6 with me. I want you to see this quickly. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians, Ephesians. Just a few pages from where you are in, Corinth, in Corinthians there. Galatians chapter 6. Look with me. I, let's back up a little bit and go to verse 6. It says, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one whom he teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever one sows, that will also reap. For the one who sows in his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of, of doing good for in due season we will reap if we don't what? Have you ever started something and gave up? Gotten tired, gotten distracted? I do. I've got projects all around my house where I lost interest or, or I got so far behind on something it was next to impossible to get caught up in the time that was left there. He says that we don't give up. So then we, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are of... Who do you think he's talking about here? Do you hear some similarities in teaching? Do you hear some, some little innuendos as Paul is talking here? What's he talking about? What, what should they not give up in sowing and reaping? This is talking about the giving of the gift to the church of Jerusalem. This is exactly the story we just read in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, where he says, hey, Galatians, don't quit. Don't give up. You're almost there. Keep going. Keep serving. Keep doing So that leads to the last question. How does God supply after I've made a commitment? When I make a commitment to God, is there any limit on what God can do? 
Is there any limit on what God can fulfill in your life? The Bible actually teaches that we receive grace upon grace. Merit upon merit. I love what he says to the church of Corinth in chapter 9. Look with me at verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Look with me at verse 10. He who supplies the seed to the sower. Who gives seed to the farmer? Well, the farm seed store, right? Just like you go get meat at the grocery store, right? I mean, ultimately, where do seeds originate? God. Where does creation originate? With God. And God says, who gives the sower his seed? And, and who gives the bread that the poor may eat? And if we were to ask Job the same question, we would find three chapters in the book of Job where God gives the explanation for how things work, right? In his economy. God says, where were you, Job, when the world was founded? And who feeds the sparrow, Job? And who makes sure that they have something to eat for breakfast? And that little squirrel that runs around chasing nuts in the field, who takes care of him? Who makes sure he's got somewhere to live? And who makes sure that the waves don't overtake the shoreline? And who makes sure that the winds blow and, and takes care of all the seasons of the earth? Who does all these things, Job? Is it not I, God? My God shall supply all my needs, not just some. Not just the ones I really think I need. I want to do a comparison contrast here as I close. Look with me at chapter 9 and verse 11 now. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only to supply the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many... What? Thanksgivings to God. Go back to chapter 8 with me and look at verse 10. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it well, so that your readiness and desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Aren't you glad that God judges us on what we have and not what we don't have? Aren't you glad as Christians, God tells us, use what you have. Moses, <laughs> poor Moses, right? How often do we pick on him? God, where are we going to get water for this many people? What's he say? Trust me. Trust me, right? I'm going to provide. Remember when he's standing before Pharaoh and uh, he has a staff in his hand. He throws a staff down, turns into a snake. Pharaoh's guys throw theirs down. Theirs turns into snakes. Uh-oh, God's got a problem. Three to one. This is not good for God. God is going to, could you imagine Pharaoh like, yep, yeah, we got this one, right? And then what does Moses' snake do? Eats the other three. So only one guy gets to walk out with a staff. And whose guy is it? It's God's guy. It's God's guy. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? We're not going to bow. We're not going to bend. We're going to burn. We're good with burning. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand before the king. And they're like, king, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. If our God who is able, we know that our God who is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace can do it. But if not, let it be known unto thee, O king, we will not bend, we will not bow, and we will not serve your God. So go ahead and throw us in. What does the king do? He gets mad. He gets real mad. He gets seven times madder than mad, right? He says, crank that furnace up, heat it up seven times. The number of perfection. The number of God. Seven times hotter than it was want to be heated. And what happened when the two men went to throw the three guys into the furnace? Do you remember? The fire was so hot, it killed the two men throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego down in the furnace. They hit the bottom of the furnace, and what, what happens? The king walks up, looks in there, and says, um, How many did we throw in? Three, king. Three. We threw three in. Two are here dead, but three are down there. Well, then who's the fourth guy? And the fourth one looks like who? 
the Son of God. What did Jesus look like before he was born? Even the unsaved know Jesus when they see him. Even the unsaved, ungodly know Jesus when they see him. How much more should we as believers know who our King is and our Lord is? Something to think about. God gave some more than they needed in order that they might have the joy of giving to those who are in need. I think there are times when God withdraws our abundance so that we understand how it feels to receive from somebody else. If COVID-19 has done anything to our economy today, it's shown that even the richest country in the world has needs. Even the richest people in the world have times where they need to go through trials to understand how good God has given us in this life. Everybody sitting in here, this auditorium today, is in the top 2% of world's richest people. Think about that. When you take all the world today, we're in the top 2%. And to whom much is given, much more is required. So this season of missions conference, a season of emphasizing missions and, and looking at missionaries and supporting missionaries, what would God have you to do this year? Not necessarily based on bank accounts, not necessarily based on your job or employment, but based on your heart. What would God move you in your heart to do for him this year? That's what we pray about. In the back, there are some forms uh, that are available for you to, to take this, this morning and, and to read through it and to pray over it. Some scriptures there as well to help you with that. But I trust that you'll go back and read 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Even First Corinthians or Second Corinthians eight and nine and Second Corinthians chapter eleven. If you want context, go back to First Corinthians sixteen and uh, and look at the scriptures and see how God laid out before us exactly what He wants us to do, and then pray this week as the our missionary Glenn Galbraith will be rolling in town about four o'clock on Saturday. Uh, there's something else going on then, isn't there? That's right. Kirsten Rosine and Hayes DeLong will be being married at 4 o'clock the same time. And uh, so be in prayer for the Galbers as they come into town. Be in prayer for the Rosines that Larry can make it through the service. Just Sharon. Just Sharon. Okay, just Sharon. And uh, now we're excited. Kirsten's here with us this morning. She had her bridal shower yesterday, so you have need of nothing now, right? You're, you're increased with goods and have need of nothing. So... And uh, so praise the Lord. Thank you for those that participated in that and gave gifts towards that as well. And uh, next Saturday at, at four o'clock, she'll be getting married and uh, it's going to be an exciting time for sure. And then Saturday, we transition right into our missions conference. So I hope that you'll be ready to hear about the United Kingdom and what God is doing in the United Kingdom from missionary Glenn Galbraith. And then Sunday night, um, we're going to do something a little different that I'll share after we get off of our live stream this morning. So, um, but, so in the back there, there are some forms for Faith Promise. If you'd like to take one of those, we ask that you only fill one of them out and place it in the offering plate over the next couple weeks. So that way we don't get multiple ones because we do use this to figure out what we're going to give. Last year or this year in our missions commitment, we're just a little over $20,000 that goes directly to missions. Um, actually, I think it was 21, 120. And uh, this year, it'd be great if we could see 23,000. That would allow us to add a missionary to our faith promise giving. So one meal a month of four to six of a family of four to six is enough to meet the church commitments and add a missionary to our mission support. So think of it from that angle. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll ask our worship team to come back up and uh, close our service for us. And then I have a couple of announcements to make once we get off the live stream this morning. I do want to thank those who watch via the live stream and those that watch throughout the week. Uh, we appreciate your love and your generosity and your gifts that you send to the church as well. And uh, praise the Lord for the vision of those that had the vision for the camera system in the past that we have it today to use in this crazy 2020 world that we live in. But praise the Lord, we know who sits on the throne. What's his name? Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love and your mercy and grace towards us. And Father, the grace upon grace that we've been given, the, the abundance that we have. And Father, I just pray that as uh, our missionaries are 
going to be traveling this, this week, Lord, that you would give them traveling mercies. I do pray for Glenn as he travels across the Atlantic Ocean to come here to the States, uh, to us ungrateful colonials, um, that we would be able to, one, encourage him, and number two, that he would encourage us. And Father, as he shares what's going on in England and the United Kingdom and, and the ministry that is there and the heritage that is there, I pray, Father, as he travels around to Wadena and to Fergus Falls and to Morris and, and here in Sox Center, Father, sharing the ministry that's there and what, God, you are doing in the midst of the people there, even in the midst of the pandemic that they're going through and the lockdowns that they have and the restrictions they have, uh, not being able to worship inside their building, but still having to be outside their building to worship, Father, that it would be something that helps us to appreciate what we do have, even right now here in America, when we compare ourselves to our brothers that are across the pond. And Father, I do pray for the different ministries that are going to be represented. I pray for our own missionaries who are around the world uh, and just the simple, simple pleasures of being able to go to a supermarket or to be able to get out of their houses, out of this quarantine, uh, that, that, that they keep being faithful and sharing the gospel and the video ministries that are flourishing out of this COVID-19 situation as well and the international scale. But Father, I pray that you would do not just the work overseas and around the world, but you do the work between our own shoulder blades. The work in our heart and in our mind, Lord, to draw us closer to you and make us more committed to you. And Father, the, the, the fields are white into harvest and the labors are few. And may this week and next week we pray that you, the Lord of the harvest, would be able to send forth labors, maybe even us, out into your harvest. May you get the glory in what's said and done this week and next week. In your name we pray. All God's people said. Lately, it seems that we are getting more and more confused about what a church actually is. So let's take some time to set the record straight. Church is not a building, though a building can be used by a church. Church is not a denomination, though a set of beliefs should be important to a church. Church is not about Sunday, though a church should not forsake meeting together. Church is not about one person or personality, though every church should be pastored. And church is not about size or growth, though every church is called to make disciples. So don't think of church as an address or a location, but rather think of church as mobile and on the move. Don't think of church as something built or planted, but rather think of church as something deployed. Don't think of church as where you are for an hour each week, but rather what you are every day of the week, because the church is the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Feet shouldn't sit still. Hands shouldn't be idle. Feet go. Hands do. This is the church. Church isn't what you're sitting through right now, because you are the church. Now go and be the church. <laughs>